Hey everyone, welcome back to the Purpose Beyond Motherhood podcast. It's Holly and Nicole here. Hey. Um, today we have an amazing guest. She is one of my dear friends. Her name is Vanessa, and she is going to share a little bit about her journey, um, her story, just the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys of it. Um, Vanessa, I really am just going to let you. <laughs> It away. Tell us about your family and then you can jump right in. Sure. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Vanessa Grant. Um, I've been married now for almost seven years and we have a three-year-old daughter named Grace. We call her Gracie for short. And I have a three-month-old boy named Whitaker. We call him Whit. And with that, we've just been very blessed to have, you know, our boy and our girl, our, our two, two babies, or even though Grace really isn't a baby, she's still my baby, but we're so blessed to have our two little babies, but in between that, we've had a little bit of a rocky road with our pregnancy, and that's why I came on this with with Holly and Nicole is to share like my experience and share just kind of the heartaches that maybe like on the outside looks like we have like this perfect family, but really it definitely has had its like high highest highs and its lowest lows, and so um, yeah, I guess I'll just kind of dive in into like what that pregnancy story looked like. So. Um, after we had Grace, I've always thought like the two year gap for babies was like the perfect age gap. And so, you know, we were ready to start our family again. And having Grace was just, you know, the pregnancy itself was always just kind of like normal, like nothing crazy. And even like postpartum, like I had a lot of like issues postpartum, like health wise, but all in all, like it definitely was just something where you're just happy to have your baby and you're happy to be pregnant. And when we started trying again for our second baby, I, you know, just same thing. Like we got pregnant fairly easily and everything was great. We go for our first um, ultrasound, you know, you find the heartbeat. It's like, I think we went at like seven weeks or so. And, you know, my husband was there, like my husband never misses an appointment. So Wes was there and it was great. So, you know, found the heartbeat all great. You go, we went back again for like our 10 week appointment. Cause we wanted to do like the genetic testing and all of that. So we go and right before the appointment, like maybe an hour or so, Wes had called me and was like, Hey, I can't make the appointment. I have like some work emergency, which is really unlike him. So for him to tell me he can't make it is like, definitely, you know, okay, I understand because he he's never missed an appointment. And at the time we've been buying a new house. So he was like, I'll just meet you for the showing. And you know, we'll be there like in an hour or later or whatever. And I was like, okay, great. So I'm in the ultrasound and we're doing everything. And you know, it gets a little bit silent. And my doctor here is just kind of making me a little nervous because he's not like talking as much, but he's kind of laughing. And he's like, Hey, do you see this? Do you see this? And I'm freaking out thinking like, Oh, what is it that you see? And it literally felt like a script out of a movie because as he was moving, you know, the wand to like show us the ultrasound, I saw the two babies appear in the ultrasound. And we at that point found out, or at least I did because Wes wasn't there, found out that we were pregnant with twins, which like twins, I mean, we had, I had no idea. Like I'm telling you how shocked I was. Like I was scared. I was emotional. Like my leg was just shaking on that stirrup because I was like, what is happening? But the crazy thing about that is my doctor's um, a little bit on the older side. He's actually delivered um, some of our friends <laughs> that are already, he's probably pushing 70 here. And he was like, kept going through the ultra. He's like, huh, this is interesting. And I was like, well, what the heck does that mean? Like you're making me a little bit nervous. He goes, you know, I've never seen this before in like my 40 years of practicing and 14,000 babies I've delivered, but it looks like you have Momo twins, which are twins that are in the exact same sac, the amniotic sac, and also share a placenta. And really for, and that means you have identical twins because anytime you share a placenta, you'll always have identical twins, um, which most of the time you have two separate sacs. But in my case, I had one sack, one placenta. And he's like, this is so rare. It happens 1% of the time. It's not something that we normally see. He goes, and what all, all that means is that your embryo split later. So it just is like a timing of when your embryo splits. So the earlier the split, the better, because you get two placentas, two sacks. And then like, it kind of just whittles down to like, okay, I split later. So I have one placenta, one sack. And it was so crazy. I mean, literally, he called in all the other all the other doctors and nurses to come see it because he was like, "This is a teaching moment. We've never seen. It's like so rare." And so you're kind of just like, "Okay, well, I don't even know what this means." And so with that, all that it really means is that they were going to monitor me very, very closely because the 
with them being in the same sack, they can touch each other, their cords can get tangled. And that's the the highest mortality rate of those types of types of babies is that they get entangled in each other's cord, the bigger that they get. And so he was like, well, you're going to have to come in like every other week. You're probably going to be hospitalized at about 24 weeks and you're going to stay hospitalized until we deliver you at 30 weeks. And he is giving me all this information, but he's like, before we kind of move forward with all of that, I need you to go see the maternal fetal medicine um, doctor to confirm that I don't, there's no membrane separating the two babies. And so I said, okay, so we go um, the next week to the uh, maternal fetal specialist to go look at the babies. And of course, I'm just on cloud nine because I'm thinking, wow, I have identical twins. Like, I'm so excited. Like, I I mean, I was always teetering on whether I wanted two or three kids. And I was like, this is great. God made the decision for me. I'm having three babies. And I'm, you know, I'm so thrilled. A little scared. Probably life is going to get a little more expensive, but definitely like on the path of like pure joy and excitement. And we go to that fetal specialist to confirm everything. And then it's like my heart just sunk when we had our... um, you know, the doctor come in and tell us what was actually going on once we did the ultrasound. And what we found out at that appointment was that we had two babies. So, you know, you have baby A and baby B and baby A was structurally as normal as they come. You know, everything was as intact. I mean, at this point, I'm only like 11 weeks. So I'm not, you know, you don't see everything, but from what they could tell at that point, everything was perfectly normal and healthy with baby A. With baby B, they told me that she had what they call limb body wall complex, which is um, where her organs are growing on the outside of her body. So her abdomen, her um, abdominal wall didn't form. So they were just growing outwardly. And at that point, they were, they told me that it wasn't a matter of if she was going to miscarry, it was just when. So typically, as they get bigger, and babies get bigger throughout your, your trimesters, Um, your organs get bigger and then the chest cavity gets, you know, starts falling because you have everything growing on the outside of their body to where it's not holding up their heart and their heart starts falling and falling to where it's not being held up and then they miscarry. So they could never survive outside of the womb. They can only survive in the womb because they have all of the nutrients of the mom to keep them going. But as they get bigger, then they end up passing. Um, at that point, there's no surgery that can be done to fix this. It's just like, unfortunately, just one of the, you know, I guess abnormalities that is just like, it is what it is. There's not anything that we can do. Um, the, from what I was told by those doctors as well, that it also was very rare, like having that type of abnormality was so rare. So the combination of having Momo twins and this body stock complex, it's like another name for it is like one in a hundred million. They're like, this doesn't ever happen. And so the doctors here in Dallas were like, to be honest, I don't really know what to tell you to do because we haven't really seen this abnormality and we haven't really seen this type of twin pregnancy. So we're not that comfortable with like treating you as a patient for this. And they were like, we have some like, you know, other contacts in Colorado that we're familiar with and maybe you can contact them. So at the time, I, you know, my dad's a doctor as well, and he had some contacts in um, Houston. And when I got together with them, they all said the same thing. They're like, we've never seen this before. And we're not really, you know, we've heard of it once. And with that, all we know what to do is that they've heard of doing like, you know, when the baby's just miscarried, like moms just kind of let fate, let's fate take its course to where it just kind of, you know, you miscarry and you miscarry both. But I was still like not convinced because no one here really knew like what was going on and like really didn't have the expertise. And so um, they recommended me to go to a doctor in Colorado who specialized in very complicated twin pregnancies. And so I went to him and he said, well, these are your options. So you have one healthy baby that if she was in her own sack would survive completely like perfectly and fine. But because you have the other baby, they share the placenta, they share the sac, is now compromising the health of the other baby. So your options are, one, you do nothing. So you just let fate take take its course. And with that, just know that that baby that's not developed correctly, your baby B, she's going to miscarry. And as she miscarries, because they share the placenta, is going to affect the baby that is healthy, and she will most likely miscarry as well. And if she doesn't miscarry, if she holds on strong and she is just a fighter, really, really fights, then she 
potentially like a 50-50 chance of having brain damage because of the placenta that they share. It's the the baby that's trying, you know, that will miscarry is trying to survive. I mean, all babies are going to try to fight to live. So they're going to take away more of those nutrients from the other healthy baby so that she can try to survive. But essentially that's going to give the other one brain damage. So I'm like, okay, I do nothing and I probably won't save my baby or either, you know, either baby, or if I do, she's going to have like a defect of, you know, her her brain not being, um, you know, developed the way that it should if she was in her own sack. There said the other option is, which he said he's only done a handful of times and never in my situation, (laughs) like, great, is they do what they call a selective reduction where you can basically end the, the pregnancy for the unhealthy, the un, or I guess it's not the best term, but like the structurally abnormal baby so that the other baby will survive. Like you're giving that other baby every fighting chance to make it. It's not guaranteed, but it's like a 90% chance survival rate to say, you know, if you end it on your terms, like you control the miscarriage of baby, the baby that's not um, structurally normal. So baby B in my case, then baby A will most likely survive because we've controlled it and we've been able to like make her chances of survival a lot higher. And that's where like everything kind of just stops because you're kind of thinking like, well, one, what would like as a mom, what should you do? Because you want to give your fighting chance to your baby that can make it if you could, but not at the expense of your other baby. And so then you're just like, well, what like, But then if I don't do anything, then like I'm not being the best mom that I can be, but then I'm not a good mom either way. Or at least that's how I felt. Like I wasn't like a good mom either way because I wasn't helping the baby that I could be helping or I was, but at the expense of my other baby. And so I felt so torn. And this is where I was like, okay, I mean, I have prayed a thousand times. I was like, this is just the hardest decision of me and my husband's life. Because even though it was our decision, I felt the burden on me because it was my body. It was me that was having to like go through with whatever procedure we needed to have. And, you know, I think the number one thing I prayed for was like, God, please don't make me make this decision. Because I I felt like if I had the baby here, I would have forever remembered that I had to, you know, I guess, terminate the other baby. Or I would felt, I would have felt that burden or that guilt that like what I had to do to bring her here into this world. Um, and a lot of friends ask me, they're like, how do I pray for you? What do I pray for? And I, I didn't even know what to tell them. I just said, you know, if you could just pray for the best possible outcome, like that was the only thing I knew what to ask them to pray for. Cause I didn't want them to say, you know, pray for this bit, ba- you know, baby a to make it. Cause I knew the only way she would really make it is if I terminated the other pregnancy. And I, and I guess the, the complicated thing about it every, of everything is that, you know, they're in that same sack. Like, even if I had gone through and, and, uh, ended the pregnancy for baby B, she would have still been in my body until I delivered because they had no way of getting the baby out. So like if once I delivered the healthy baby, like at full term or close to it, um, I would have delivered the second baby as well. Just, and I just felt like it was just such a constant reminder of like, this is the choice that I made. Is this, you know, and I didn't know what the right choice was. And so in the end, I, you know, my husband and I were actually, going to move forward with the selective reduction. Cause I just felt like at the time I couldn't not save the pregnancy for baby A. I just felt like I, I, I wanted to do what I could to at least save that baby, knowing that the other baby was always going to miscarry. And, but that did not sit well with me. I mean, I've had so many, like, like, I mean, I think I, I don't think I slept at all that whole time because I just weeks and weeks, I'm just thinking about like, what do I do? What do I do? What's the right decision? Am I being a good mom? Am I being a good Christian? Like what I want this baby. I, we made this baby out of love or we made these babies out of love. Like it wasn't, you know, this is something that we prayed for and it just kept me up at night every night. Like, you know, there's definitely things where you're just like, how can I live with myself if I make this decision? But I, you know, to be honest, I just really didn't know what to do. And, you know, from what, I guess like the crazy part about all this is that, you know, you're, I I couldn't do that procedure until I was a certain, like at least 18 weeks because your placenta had to be fully mature and your sac had to be attached to the placenta or else you'd risk rupturing the, the, um, the sac. And so I was going every week and doing all of my ultrasounds and the 
day before I was supposed to fly out to Colorado to do this procedure, um, we did one last ultrasound because of course we weren't going to make the trip if, you know, t- before we knew everything was okay. And I found out that I had lost bo- both, both babies at that last ultrasound. And I was just, I mean, just a hot mess. Like I had cried. I thought I already cried every tear that had ever happened, but I had cried so many tears after hearing that and, or, and especially from the doctor and knowing that. And because I was already 18 weeks at that point, I had to deliver them. So I, I had to go in and deliver them because I was they were already big enough to where that was, you know, you couldn't do anything else. And I was already in my second trimester. I, I think like you do DNCs in your first trimester, but your second trimester, you either do d and I think it was like D&Es or you deliver them. And D&Es are for, um, from what my doctor told me, is like they don't even do those procedures in Texas because that's if you're doing like an abortion, I think. So um, they're like the only option you have is to actually deliver the babies unless you go out of state and do a D and E. So I went, I delivered the babies, which was like any other delivery. Like they, they induce you, they give you, like, I remember they gave me Pitocin. I was there, I was in labor for about 14 hours. Like they have, like I was given an epidural cause the pain was just so, so much. And I just remember the nurse saying, okay, like the babies are ready. Like after, you know, 10 or however many hours it was 14. And I just start crying. I was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Like, you know, they're coming. But when I delivered them, um, the doctor had told me at that time that their cords were actually wrapped in each other. Excuse me. So baby B's cord was wrapped around baby A's neck. So they actually didn't pass from the abnormality at all. It was actually through just like being in the same sack and being able to touch each other was through the cords. And I'll tell you, I have never felt more of a relief in my life because I didn't have to make the decision of, you know, am I going to terminate the pregnancy or at least the baby that wasn't healthy? Am I doing it at the, you know, for the sake of baby A, but like, I didn't have to make that decision. So hearing that it was the cords that I was truly like God answering my prayers, because I'll tell you when I say I prayed to not make this decision, this decision, I mean, that was the only thing I prayed for because I didn't want to make the decision. I just felt like that was just not something I wanted to do. But I also didn't want to like not do anything for my babies either. And, you know, after we delivered them, I held them, you know, we wrapped them and I held them and I had uh, a deacon come and a a pastor come um, and we did a blessing and we prayed over them. And, you know, my, my sister was actually there as well. And we wrapped them in baby blankets and it was just more of like, Cause I also, you know, struggled with the decision of should I hold them or should I not hold them? And I am so, 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 so glad that I did. And, you know, my husband was there and he was like holding me, holding them. We prayed over them and it just felt a bit of a relief, but like, you know, obviously I was so, so sad, but just the fact that we didn't have to like go through with that decision and at the hospital, you know, we had the choice at that time, if we could, if we wanted to cremate them or, you know, have a burial service for them. And we decided to cremate them because at the hospital, they have a garden for stillborn babies only. And the garden is just for you to cremate them and spread their ashes and do a ceremony with them. And something about them being with other stillborn babies and like having friends, it was just something that was so comforting to me. So I just loved that. And so um, we did that and we spread their ashes and it was more of like, you know, part of the closure, but not, you know, not there yet. And I think just kind of like going through it, like luckily, like a couple of months later, like Wes and I got pregnant again, you know, we had our baby boy and where I really felt the closure is even after we had their memorial service um, a year later for them is that when I delivered our boy with, it was in the exact same room that I had delivered the twins. And I remember the nurses asking me like, Hey, do you want to go to another room? And I was like, absolutely not. Like, I felt like God really provided that moment for me. It was like a full circle moment. Like we had the most extreme sadness in our entire life. I never had felt that kind of sadness before. But then I also had the most extreme happiness, you know, in my life, like to where I was like, this is just such a moment that was provided by him to like, give me a sense of like, everything happens, you know, for a reason. And, you know, I've told Holly this like several times, but I feel like, you know, this situation, it was so terrible and it was so just shocking. And it was, I felt, I've never felt like that sort of like grief and sorrow before, 
but I really do feel like God tests our faith. And it's part of like to where when you have these really hard times, you're you have like a fork in the road and your choices, you can either pull away from God or you can lean in a lot closer. And my husband and I really leaned in like together. I never felt stronger. Like it was just one of those things where we were just so connected and we were just so spiritual and it just brought us to like the spiritual high to where I was like praying on him every day, all the time. And even now I just have never felt more connected. And like, you would think going through something so sad that you're just like, you could be angry. Like you have that choice of saying, I'm going to be angry and I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to welcome any blessings that come in my life. I'm not going to welcome any happiness and just have that negativity in you. But for us, it just, it, it we had our moment of, of grieving and I still cry about it clearly, but it's not something that I, you know, take lightly, but it is something where I felt like it had its purpose. And that purpose was for us to be reconnected to our faith and be reconnected. And I wouldn't say that we've ever lost it, but it was more so just strengthening it, you know, like just in bringing us together as a couple, because we, you know, we've been married for, like I said, you know, at that point, like six years and, you know, we never had gone through any hardships, but it wasn't like we were doing anything that was like, it almost felt like our spiritual, our spirituality was kind of run of the mill. Like it was just, you know, it was there. We were, you know, going through the motions, we were doing everything, but now I feel like I have purpose. Like now I feel like, okay, this is what happened to me. God brought me through it. God brought us through it. God helped us bring us together. God gave me another beautiful baby boy, like gave us that miracle. And it was just kind of like everything kind of worked its way to how it, you know, for us, how it should be. And so it was one of those things where you're just like, okay, you know what? I, I, I'm so sad that this happened, but I'm also so happy that it did too, in the sense of like thinking of, us being together. And Wes, Wes lost his mom in uh, when he was in high school from cancer. And so one of the things that we were always like knowing and what we loved was that like when they passed, like she was there to just welcome them with open arms. And so that was just something that we love so much. And that part of the other thing is that being twins, like they were together from the beginning. Like all these babies have known is love and faith. They've only known that we've loved them that God loves them. They never left home. Like they were just always right where they needed to be. And that's all they've known is just the, the, you know, our faith together as a family, as you know, from, from everything that we, you know, prayed for them for, like before they were born, as they were, you know, going through the pregnancy, as they were born, it's just, that's all they've known. And that's, and they've always been together. And, and that, that just brings me a lot of comfort. It brings me a lot of just peace knowing that, you know, we were, you know, we did everything that we thought we needed to do and it just happened the way that it should. And so, you know, coming back like this full circle moment, we have our other baby here. And I'll tell you, even though like a part of it was like the guilt, like, should I have gotten pregnant so quickly? Like, why am I not having another girl or why not? Am I not having like twin girls or identical twin girls for that matter? But you know what God gives, God provides what you need. And like, this is what I need. I needed something a little bit different. Because I do think I would have just constantly been like, well, comparing it, I guess, or comparing it to them. But God gave me exactly what I needed. I didn't know I needed it, you know, at the time, but I definitely do now. And now I just feel like, you know, I feel so much more complete. I feel like, you know, I've had my closure, like with the process, but that doesn't mean I don't think about them every day because I do. And I mean, I really, really do. I mean, we have just one of those things where you just like, you know, you have your box of like the memories of like their, you know, how you pictures of them, like pictures of me holding them, like we have all of that. But it just was something where I felt like, you know what, this happened because, you know, God, like I said, test our faith. He definitely is there. And he wants to know, like, are you going to draw me in closer when you need me? Because he he's not just going to be there during your your best times. He's not going to just be there at your worst time. He's always there. And he's always going to be there through everything. And I truly felt like I had cast my worries and my doubts and my my just like being scared onto him. And he provided all of the comfort that I needed. And I didn't realize I needed it as much as I did until I received it. And that's where now I just feel like just so much more connected and so much more connected with my husband. And it's just been, I mean, even our daughter, Grace, like we talk about the twins, like we pray about them every night. We, you know, we say that they're in her heart and we just think about like, you know, where we, where we started and where we we came from and just kind of like where we've ended up now. And so that's, it's just been a very 
crazy windy road. But, you know, in the end, I'm actually very happy that this happened because I learned so much about myself, a lot of our relationship with God and our relationship as a couple with God, which is also very, you know, was really, really important to me. And then just like my relationship with my husband. And so now we're at this full circle moment, but that's kind of, I mean, in the gist of everything, that's really kind of a, a crazy story, but also a, a, a heartwarming one for me and, and, you know, everything that we've been through because of it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I should have, I, oh my gosh, my dog. I should have grabbed Kleenex before you started talking because I'm like, I'm going to have to wash my sweater because I, was like, <laughs> oh, okay. I cried a lot too. <laughs> But there are so many things that you said. I mean, I first just had to tell you I'm so proud of you because I know this is this isn't an easy thing to talk about, but it brings such honor to their legacy and just the way that the Lord can use their lot. Like they have so much purpose, even from where they are in that sweet memorial um, by the hospital. So I just want to wish I could hug you through the computer. <laughs> um, I just hearing you talk about how your faith was strengthened. When I remember every time you would give me an update, I was like, Lord, like this is like, this has been enough. Can we like lessen this load for her? And at every turn, I feel like you were so surrendered to his plan for your girls and your family, Um, which is, it's not easy. It's easy to say that, but it's not easy to actually do it. So I just want to condone your complete surrender and your faith in him and the way that you and Wes even before I knew y'all well, I feel like y'all have such an anointing as a couple, um, just as leaders and going through things and going through them well and turning people back to the Lord through them. Um, I feel like you guys are just a powerhouse. <laughs> I, I really do. I really do feel that way. Um, I did want to ask you if there was anything do you remember anything someone said that was helpful? Anything that was not helpful? I don't think, it, I don't, honestly, I don't think anyone was not helpful. I think, okay. you know, unfortunately, like there is, as you probably guys know, is that there's a lot of like miscarriages, pregnancy, you know, infant loss. And I felt like a lot of people reached out and like helped me like, like, hey, like, you know, when this happened, like I did this and that actually helped me. I know some people maybe, I don't know if they like that or not, but I felt like all of my friends, like really, I mean, and family, like really just surrounded me and just were like, what can I pray for? Like, what can I do? And all of that meant so much to me. And it was just kind of everything that I needed, just that support. Cause even like after the delivery, I mean, Holly, you came by and like dropped off like one of the 12 ministries, like butterfly boxes and that I, all of the cards that you gave me in that box are in the memorial box with them. Like, and so i saved that with because I just and I remember like I when my mom came I like pulled it out and I showed her I was like oh this is what Holly gave me as part of like the butterfly box and I loved it and I still I read through those cards like every time I go through their memorial box and so that was something I loved and I think like to me I'm I'm a person that like I don't just store things and then don't look at it like I store things and I always come back to it so loved that and then I also just loved just people reaching out like at, throughout any time like if people would reach out to me at like you know, two in the morning and just say, how are you doing? Like if they were up feeding their baby or something. And I loved that because I, I needed people to reach out to me. Like I wasn't going to necessarily talk, call people and say, Hey, I need you, but people just did. And, and they could have just said, Hey, I'm checking in on you. I don't need you to respond. Just wanted to say, I'm thinking of you. That meant everything to me because I just wanted like to feel like that people were praying for me, even if like I wasn't reciprocating any conversation back, just I, I maybe wasn't in like the mental space to do it. But that like meant everything to me, like at all points, because, you know, you always want to feel that support from your surroundings and from your community. So that was really helpful. Yeah. Also, Vanessa's like five feet tall and like, the strongest <laughs> little like not let I me mean, she's not little but the strongest of my short like the strongest little powerhouse I don't know it blows my mind I'm just so proud of her thanks Holly Vanessa thank you so much for sharing your story it really it you inspire me just your your faith and and how you stood through all of that <laughs> and how you can talk how, how joyful you are, um, just sharing your story. Yes, you shed, you know, you shed a few tears, but how you can say, Hey, I was able to stand. 
I am still standing because of the grace and the love and the covering of our heavenly father. And I think that that's beautiful. Like, I, I don't think I've ever heard a story and I've heard, I, I'm getting emotional. I've heard so many stories and I don't think I've ever heard someone say this happened to me, but God, you know, but I can stand and I, I just, you're, you're incredible and your <laughs> faith is inspiring. And just thank you so much for just sharing today. Cause I think we can all take something positive away from what you said today, regardless of what journey we're on, you know, it, in our motherhood or infertility or loss or whatever, that we all have something to take away and learn from your story. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really, I'm really glad. I think this was definitely a part of like a cathartic, like, you know, process for me. Um, but honestly, it's just been something I've wanted to tell because I've never like really have the people that know this story are just the people that are closest to me. I haven't really shared it much more than that. I mean, people know that I've lost my, you know, my twin babies, but they don't really know the decisioning process that happened behind or just like even the whole story at, at, with everything we've gone through with it. But it definitely feels right to do this. Like it definitely feels like it's it's time to kind of open up more about it and everything. I will. I feel like I have this picture of you in my head, like at every turn, at every decision you had to make, I felt like you were so open handed. And I just, I know I've already said the word surrender, but I feel like at every turn you were like, Lord, like I'm trying my best here, but you were like, I need you to help me. Like this is what's in my hands. And I feel like through, through the painful loss of them, like you said, he did answer your prayer, but I have never seen someone turn back time and time again and just come in that constant state of surrender. Like it wasn't about you. You were like, these, I want to cover my babies. Like how can I be the best mom to them? And I think that is such an amazing takeaway for so many women and just people. (laughs) Well, and I, I know Holly, I think I, I told you this, but, um, while like this whole thing was happening and I was just obviously in a state of like not sleeping and just a state of grief, Um, I did have a a dream, which is like a very crazy experience for me. I've had like these like dreams at my big milestones in life. But this one was interesting because as I found out what happened or what was happening with the twins and like the fact that one was developed normally and one wasn't, I had this dream of all of these women, like basically like in a portrait and it was like younger women. And it was like kind of like a flip book where you, you know, like where you do um, where you like flip the pages and you like see a story. That was what my dream was. It was all these like portraits of women in this, I guess, like in a frame. And they all just said, we're like, pray for her, pray for her, pray for her. And that was like in my dream. And I just remember in my dream, I was thinking like, is is Jane there, which is Wes's mom. And she, I remember her portrait had popped up and she was like, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And so it was just crazy because then I woke up and I, and this was at the very beginning of like me finding out, like it was the same day that I had found out um, about the twins, like having, uh, you know, the abnormality there. And I just remember thinking like all of these women, I don't even know. I, I mean, this was like in my dreams. It was like all these women, heavenly women, angels are like my guardian angels are praying over me. My, you know, this grandma Jane, which is what we call her is praying over us. It's like, it was such a, a surreal moment because I've only had these dreams, like at major milestones, like right after we got married, like right when Wes and I met, and I felt like a lot of it had to do with like Wes's mom. Like it's like she is just our guardian angel over our family. And it, I think that also helped me. Like it was just one of those things where you're just like, did I really just dream that? Like I, clearly I was like, uh, like unconscious when this was happening. But I think that also helped because I realized like it, it was just like I said, this flip book of just young women that were just like saying, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And I was like, wow, like this is the Lord speaking to me. He is telling me that he is behind me a hundred percent. Like, and that's where I knew it's like, he wouldn't put you through these obstacles if he wasn't going to help you get through them. And that's like where you just have to trust the process and you have to trust your faith to say, okay, he brought me to this. He'll get me through it you have to, you have to surrender yourself to that process. And that's where like, I felt for me is where I felt like, okay, I have to just do what he wants me to, because, you know, like we have to go through these things and sometimes it just makes us better people and stronger for it. And that was a pretty defining moment for me is when, when I had that dream. 
crazy, <laughs> but it happened. It. That's yes. He'll show you what what you need. He really will. Yes. yes. I know. Vanessa, thank you so much for just being on the podcast and reminding us all that when we surrender to the Lord, that he is, is there for us. He will stand in the gap for us. Um, you know, and just, I don't know, it's, there's just so many things that, um, your story has really just, just shown, shown me, you know, and I know our listeners are going to just be so blessed. So again, thank you for just reminding us to to surrender to God and what he wants to do in and through our lives. And so we're so grateful for you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This was really, this was good for me too. <laughs> so I'm really glad I came on here. Okay. So friends, we'll see you the next time on the Purpose Beyond Motherhood podcast.